My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. Other people make friends. I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate, teach, and figure out how days like today happen. Call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Who's safe? Who isn't? Who needs help? Who's in trouble? Who needs a miracle? That's what it comes down to in the age of COVID-19. That's what's driving stocks, including today, where the Dow rebounded 1,167 points. The S&P surged 4.94%. And the Nasdaq pole vaulted 4.95%. All incredible moves based on the hope that federal government stimulus could offset the sudden slowdown that we're getting in the economy and also beat the demand shock that is caused by the coronavirus. So how do you pick among the rubble now that we're bouncing, at least for the moment, even if you think that the stimulus may be too little, too late, which is certainly the judgment I heard all day. It is always the judgment that you hear, particularly among the people a little skeptical of the president. First, you have to recognize that for all intents and purposes, the market, it's, it's not working. Or you can say it isn't working well. How about that? These violent swings, what are they a sign of? They are a sign of sickness. It's unhealthy. They tell us people are scared. And there are far too few players, too many investors, too many guys with machine guns. First stops to be able to handle the impact of that fear. And it doesn't help that you have hundreds of ETFs pulling and pushing on individual stocks like the tail wagging the dog. (laughs) The market just can't handle all this algorithmic activity, all the so-called machines. It just can't handle it. It's overrun. It doesn't know what to do. It's broken. The good news. Well, you can use these wild swings that are caused by the crazy machines that are going wild to take advantage of opportunities by identifying high-quality companies, okay, don't think of them as stocks, companies, and then buying their stocks gradually into weakness at your prices instead of having to chase stocks, which has been the M.O. of this market for the first years of President Trump's reign, save for the bear market that that Chairman Powell caused at the end of 2018. Now, if you, by the way, I am suggesting, and I think you should, look, I know, you know, index fund, yeah, yeah, bye, bye, bye. But if, if you, by the way, I'm suggesting, say you put on a small position when the market's up 1,100 points, Well, you won't feel like a moron when it plunges back to negative territory, which is what happened today, right? I mean, it opened up 900, then it went to negative, then it came all the way back. See, if you just go out there and buy all at once, you're liable to get the wrong price, which would make that's why you need to, until we are on firmer footing on terra firma, you have to buy the way I'm describing. In a broken world like this one, you have to be ready to own more and more of a stock on the way down. You have to like it more. Remember, good stocks get cheaper as they go lower, not more expensive and not more dangerous. If you can't see that, if you're going to panic the next time we get hit, you might want to use the moment of strength that we have right now to sell. I don't know if you should own stocks. Maybe just own an index fund and just do what Warren Buffett would say. This is a market where you need rock-solid conviction to buy anything so that when your favorite stocks inevitably go down, and they will, you can view it as an opportunity, not a catastrophe. When the Dow briefly went negative today before bouncing right back, that, that was your moment to buy stocks hand over fist. But you only want to buy the good ones. That way you won't be shaken out. And if you sold rather than bought that dip, well, you may not be tall enough to handle this new, more demanding uh, of conviction market. Maybe you should just go home. All right, so how can you separate the wheat from the chaff in something that's violent and volatile? Well, you have to understand the nature of this downturn. I keep telling you this is a public health crisis. It is not a financial crisis. I'm not worried about the banking system. I'm not worried about your ATM. Yesterday, though, it also turned out that there was an oil crisis. That was really kind of a big part of the big decline. With the collapse of crude prices because of, well, we're the world's largest oil producer, and thanks, that's thanks to the fracking revolution, and Russia doesn't like it. They wanted to knock out our producers, just get them out of the game. Of course, that hurts everybody. So in retaliation, Saudi Arabia figured they'd do the same thing to Russia as Russia's trying to do to us. At these prices, many U.S. oil companies will go under. But if prices bounce back, well, then they may be uh, be able to eke out some uh, profit. Well, But that is a mighty big if, though. How can oil bounce back big beyond today when both Russia and Saudi Arabia are trying to flood the world with oil? We just don't have enough demand. I don't care about the 10% bounce today. To me, it's not, not sustainable. Uh, that's something we'll go, go over when we do a special 
off the chart segment about oil and gas later in the show. I know everyone said, oh, this market, stock market, dead cat bounce. You want a dead cat bounce? I think it's oil, given the fact that the Saudis are going to pump more than 12 million barrels a day, and we can't handle that. For now, let's do some elimination from the get-go to see what's worth focusing our money on and what isn't worth wasting your time on. A lot of times I feel like if we weed out what's not going to work, it makes the picture clearer. In a public health crisis, needless to say, you should be worried about your health. The best way to avoid this virus is to stay home. That's why all the colleges are closing, so many businesses are closing. They want you to stay home. No, and I'm not going to tell you to buy Netflix. I'm not just... That's not a bad idea. All right. The worst way to handle a crisis like this is to travel, to go out, to be on an airplane, to go visit, to go to a game. As I see it, that means vast swaths of this market are simply untouchable. Think entertainment, hotels, restaurants, retail, airlines, and, of course, the cruise lines. We're a service-based economy, so this is really negative for us. Until COVID-19 is solved, and I believe the COVID will be beaten, one way or another, these groups are toxic to your financial health. On the other hand, the virus seems to have peaked already in China, Japan, and South Korea. These are all countries that took aggressive measures to contain the outbreak. On the other hand, the disease is going nuts in Italy and Iran. So which are we? So far, we don't know yet. But I'm not feeling super optimistic at this moment. One of the reasons why we don't know is that we simply don't have enough test kits already. I cannot believe this. It's a far cry from South Korea where their hospitals set up drive-through testing that helped them get a handle on the situation. That was a brilliant idea. But here in America, we have no surety that comes from having these tests available to all. And that's a huge problem. If you believe that there are tests available, I can tell you that in New York, unless if you have a 100-degree temperature and have a cough, you're not sick enough to get one. If, you don't turn th- if we don't turn things around, the economic flaw from this pandemic could be a lot worse than it needs to be, and I am not sugarcoating this at all. Speaking of the fallout, though, the president's actively discussing ways to tie these troubled industries over, low to no interest loans for small businesses, government subsidized paid sick leave for workers so that they can afford to stay home, uh, pushing back the deadline for filing your taxes with no penalty or, in- or interest charges, maybe even a payroll tax cut to the end of the year. That's fine if you have a job. All these things can help. Now, there are also signs that President Trump isn't just hoping for the best, like I criticized him for uh, on Monday. He's planning for the worst, at least on the economic side of things. That's encouraging. I like these. Hate them or like them. You should like this. Again, though, this is a public health crisis with knock-on effects that hurt the rest of the economy. Most of these plans, are only at, oh, they only address the knock-on effects. This stimulus is not a reason to go buy the stocks that are in the blast zone, like a Carnival or American Airlines or Darden, parent of Olive Garden, even as much as they bounce, say, and you're salivating. Don't go there. You never want to own these stocks going into a slowdown, let alone a possible recession. Then there's the oil patch. Today, Oxy, <laughs> Oxy Petroleum, what did I tell you? I had to cut that dividend. No surprise after they foolishly borrowed billions to acquire Anadarko at the top of the market last year. Stock rallied 14.6% today, mostly because the price of crude rebounded to 34. I say big deal. If you think crude's going to stay down here in the 30s, which make a lot of sense because of the lack of demand from COVID and the plethora of supply from Russia and Saudi Arabia, you've got to avoid the whole complex. I'm not... Plus, I don't like them just from ESG purposes. But you know that. I've been more negative than anybody. Now, the bank stocks sold off hard yesterday because Wall Street worried that the pain of the oil patch will spread to the financial sector in addition to that yield curve that is so bad for their bottom line. Now, there's probably too much negativity, which is why the whole group rebounded dramatically today. But their earnings are still at risk. I think you can pick at the banks for a trade the next time they revisit yesterday's lows. And I've got a couple later in the show if you watch. Not wild about them. So now that we've taken all these sectors off the table... We can now discuss what we got left. What doesn't have much earnings risk and is attractive after sell-off? First, as I keep telling you, you can buy the drug stocks. You can buy whenever their yields go north of 3%. That happens pretty much every single swoon. You can put a bid down there and get hit. Given that Wall Street's worried about a recession and interest rates are ultra low, big pharma just makes sense. Hey, why why don't you look at this AbV, please? They just had a good analyst meeting. They're closing their deal with Allergan. It's got a once in a lifetime pill for migraine. You know I know this market. Same goes for the yields yields of the utilities. I like these 3% or higher. American Electric Power, you know, we have them on all the time. We have kind at all the time. We have Dominion. I like them. Southern don't have them on, but it's okay, 4%. Then there are the toughest ones, the tech stocks, where you're betting that they'll be able to keep growing no matter what. And that's why we call them secular growth plays. And there you have to think of cloud companies, Adobe, Salesforce, Mark Benioff, Microsoft, ServiceNow, 
Remember, ServiceNow is run by Bill McDermott. That's a step up. I like Alphabet. I like Amazon. I think the Amazon numbers may be too low. I think Facebook's numbers could be light, but the stock's been hit hard enough that maybe it's okay. I know when you cut numbers, stocks go down, but that one's intriguing. These kinds of high growth names do tend to outperform in recession because they're riding powerful long-term themes that keep working even a weaker economy. I've got a med tech company later in the show. If you stick with us, we'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. That's why I always eye the fastest growing tech stocks in the slow. They bounce back quickly and often become leaders for the next leg up. Now, we'll get that leg when we cure. Notice I said not if. When we cure or contain COVID-19, even if their earnings could be a tad shy. Stocks are certainly down. I'm convinced that we can beat this thing if the government pulls out all the stops with a Manhattan Project level of investment for billions of dollars. Get the great minds together. If you share my ultimate optimism, these are the stocks to buy. I know that seems like a small list, but here's the bottom line. Until today, I've been adamant the only thing you can buy with for high-yielding farm and a handful of utilities. That's it. No others. Now we're further along, and you got my blessing to buy the tech stocks with powerful secular growth stories. We're stuck in a deflationary cul-de-sac here, and that's when tech totally shines, as does pharma and the utilities, while most other stocks struggle or ultimately fail. Jose in Texas, Jose. I want to take a look at U.S. Steel, ticker symbol X. This stock plummeted to historical low, now trading in the $6 range. Last year, this is a $20 stock. I know this company is facing layoffs, tariff increases, and not the only effect of the coronavirus. With all that being said, I personally think this stock is a steal. No pun intended, Jim. What are your thoughts? No, I mean, we buy quality in this market. We don't trade down, we trade up. Newcore is the company that has the earnings. Newcore is the company that has the yield. Newcore is the company to own if you like steel. I'm not a big steel fan right here, but that's the one to buy. Let's go to Phil. Oh, Phil in New Jersey. Phil. Hey, Jim. Love the show. Thank you, Phil. What would your advice be to the vast, silent majority of your audience that are not individual stock pickers, but rather are index fund investors that have consistently and diligently been contributing to their company's 401k through dollar cost averaging into large cap stock index funds, small cap stock index funds, and international stock index funds over the course of 20 to 30 plus years, right. particularly the people close to retirement or even in retirement. Well, OK, you just changed the whole dynamic there. I mean, what I was going to say is, is that uh, you just stay the course. But if you're close to retirement or, in, or uh, you're about to retire, I don't think you should have all that much in index funds. I think you got to cut it back a little because we don't know what's going to happen with the market. It's a little uncertain for you. But I did, especially if we're going to recession. But I'm still in favor of a, of a very large position for uh, of index funds. That's what I like. And you left out gold entirely. And I think gold has to be 10 percent of your portfolio because we are in uncertain times and gold will be a good place to be in this kind of uncertainty. I get it. The market isn't working well. Kind of feels like it's broken. But there are still some sectors that you can work with. One additional sector, the secular growth, more than we had yesterday. I believe tech could shine. Oh, man, but, and med tech, by the way. Oh, man, money tonight. Forget earnings. I'll tell you what. That's why it's all about the balance sheet in times of crisis. Then after the worst day for the Dow since 2008, followed by today's bounce, is it time to do some buying here of some special stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average? I'm going to make some sense of things. And I'm eyeing names that work despite the volatility. Don't miss my sit down with the kind of stock I'm talking about that's tech secular growth. It's Dexcom. Let's see if that stock makes sense for you here. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.